um, we'll get going now uh, and hopefully the other participants will be able to join in. A brief word about TDL for those who are not familiar. TDL is a membership association with corporates, SMEs, universities and research institutes who exchange experience, share market and technology insights to improve digital services in Europe. And it's a place where members exchange ideas and it's a, a multi-stakeholder, non-political, not-for-profit organisation. So that's what I wanted to say about TDL. So we've got three speakers, myself uh, from TDL. I'm going to talk about stimulating the market, looking at what the European Union or the European Commission has been coming out with very recently. And next, hopefully, we have Afonso Ferreira, who is Research Director at CNRS and at IRIT um, at the University of Toulouse 3. And he's going to be talking about the interplay between governance, technology and policy in metaverses. And last but not least, Shukun Tokas, who is research scientist from Syntef Digital. And she's going to be looking at some of the research work she and her colleagues have been doing around metaverses, looking at trustworthiness and some of the associated challenges. So uh, first to start with, um, a quote from a senior partner at McKinsey um, stating that, as we know, uh, connecting virtually has been around for decades, but it is becoming increasingly real. People are using it, money is being spent, and um, people are taking chances. And it is difficult to separate the hype from the reality, which is essentially what intrigues, certainly intrigues me and probably many of you too, as to what is real and what is what is um, hype. And uh, there's this uh, characteristic McKenzie warning, warning, warning about um, what happened during the first dot com boom um, with the enthusiasm there, but nevertheless, the internet progressed and we are where we are today. So whether it is hype or reality, something big is coming down the road. And to start with uh, looking at some of the terminology involved, metaverse and virtual worlds. So metaverse literally means beyond universe. It's immersive, it's constant uh, virtual, virtual 3D world. People interact through avatars and so on. And the other expression is virtual worlds, uh, an expression which is more comprehensive than metaverse and one that is tends to be prefer preferred by the European Union. Um, and we also um, are hearing people talking about the transition from Web 3.0, um, which was about openness, decentralization and user empowerment to um, what comes next, which is Web 4.0, artificial ambient intelligence, IoT, trusted blockchain, virtual worlds and XR capabilities. So many of the things that we're talking about in the context of metaverse and virtual worlds. So um, the European Union has been busy and a timely, there was a communication from the Commission yesterday. Um, when we arranged this webinar, we didn't realize that this was gonna happen the day before the webinar, it's just so you get lucky sometimes. Um, and there's been a communication um, about um, the need for competitiveness, competitiveness uh, of the EU with Web 4.0 and the, the transitions technologically and seamless interconnection. And the Council has called for the EU to stay at the forefront of Web 4.0. Um, and virtual worlds are a very important part of this, as I indicated a moment or so ago. Um, and as uh, the lady from McKinsey said at the beginning, virtual worlds have been around for a long time. Um, the Commission believes that virtual worlds will be an important aspect of the digital decade and impact the way people work, create, share content and so on and so forth. So there are opportunities, risks, challenges, and so on associated with this. And the Commission provided a, a paper yesterday, um, which is going to be presented to the Council tomorrow. So we're sitting right between these two events. Um, 
looking at a number of different aspects. What's at stake for European society, for the European economy? Um, and um, the initiative that uh, the, the Commission or, or the, the institutions are proposing is based on four pillars, people and skills, business, public services and governance. And a lot of this has come through um, recommendations from some work that has been done over the last six, nine months with a European citizens panel on virtual worlds, um, which came up with 23 recommendations, which provide the foundation for the paper that they have produced. Um, the initiative contains uh, 10 action points to support, encourage, monitor and coordinate in the usual kind of way associated with those four pillars. Um, with some very specific um, deep diving, very specific notions about what should be done, as well as some of the more general um, EU type recommendations about monitoring and coordinating between member states. Um, one of the things, among the things that they produce are some figures, um, and there are lots of figures that we'll see in the next slide, uh, about the size of the global market growing from 27 billion in 22 to 800 billion by the end of the decade. And uh, uh, showing as an example, um, the automotive industry going from 1.9 million billion to 16.5 billion. So a dramatic increase over the eight, next eight years. Um, and associated with this, there is the assumption that this will enable the creation of uh, a lot of new jobs, up to almost a million new jobs related to extended reality uh, technologies in Europe in the next two years. These are very bold statements and very bold, um, sorry, very bold uh, ambitions. So uh, one of the things that most people associate, not necessarily you guys, but a lot of people associate metaverse with meta. So what is the matter with meta? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, as we know, has had a, a vision of the future. He changed the name of his company to sort of reflect that. Um, they invested a lot of money in um, 22 um, in their reality labs, and they're expected to invest a considerable amount this year, despite the fact that they are um, drawing back on investment in, uh, or appear to be drawing back on investment in metaverse uh, in favor of um, AI, turbocharging the company's work on AI tools, um, as has been said. But um, the activity in metaverse is expected to fuel one trillion dollars by the end of 2025, which is a lot of money. Um, so it's not just Meta, it's also Microsoft and Apple uh, who are working on um, some of the user aspects and, and how to uh, um, look at metaverses and virtual worlds um, in the anticipation of a mixed reality um, which will go mainstream. So finally, uh, before we move on, it's not just meta, um, beyond meta's metaverse. Now, it's important to say this because a lot of people assume it's just the big guys that are doing this, but there is a whole list of different types of metaverses based on different kind of technology um, platforms providing different um, type of activities. A lot of it is around entertainment, a lot of it is around games, um, but there is quite a bit also around property investment and real estate, as you can see from this list here. Uh, so all of this is a work in progress. There are a lot of people using these various different metaverses, um, but it's still very early days yet. Um, and a, a lot of the problem is going to be just general acceptability, uh, the use of the availability of headsets, the attractiveness of headsets for users. But again, coming back to McKinsey, finishing off where we started here, the metaverse concept is predicted to add 
five trillion dollars to the value of the global economy by 2030. That's a lot of money. Um, and it's a prediction based around focus groups and discussions with users, businesses and so on and so forth. And they've broken it down into a number of different sectors, as you can see on the right hand side. So there's a whole load of stuff going on here. Um, and it remains to be seen whether uh, how this pans out, but certainly it's very confusing um, how much is hype and how much is reality. Certainly a lot of the big players, including the European Union, are betting, um, if not the whole farm, certainly a considerable amount of the stables on um, virtual reality, extended reality, um, being a significant um, direction and seamless internet interconnectivity over the next um, five to ten years. So that is by way of an introduction and I'd like to hand over if possible to Afonso who I know has also been having some difficulty connecting and he'll be talking about the interplay between governance, technology and policy in metaverses. Um, Afonso, can you can you join? Can you hear me here? Can hear you fine. Yes. Okay, because now I'm in a second interface because the first one didn't work for the mic. Ah, okay. I will try and launch my own. You can see me? No, not yet, right? But not yet. Not yet. Okay. So I'll try and launch my and use control. That's good. So okay, so it will not work like this. Sorry for this, but it will take some time. Too long, I hope. So No, uh, share. Can you see my screen? Not yet, Ponce. No, I can't see my screen in my other. Interface. We can see now. Yes, that's good. It is unbelievable. Okay, okay so. so um, but, but my, my camera, camera seems not, not to be working. Afonso, we hear you hear our echo Hello. as well. Hello. Yeah. Now I got this. Uh, but my camera is not working, is it? No. Up. No. Yes. You should see me now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So I feel I feel like I'm in a I mean, that submarine that actually collapsed, imploded. I had several screens. Uh, anyway, so thank you very much, David, for the invitation to this uh, nice webinar. Next time, please don't use Microsoft Teams, which is good for project management and not for video, uh, for video conferencing. At least it's my, uh, it's my take on this. Um, Thank you very much for all of you who were patient enough with uh, my problems with microphones and cameras. I will quickly uh, share my uh, what we are doing. So we are researchers uh, and with, with respect to metaverse and actually we, we work on, on this interplay between governance, technology and policy. And uh, so the idea is how actually we can use all these uh, policy and governance questions uh, in order to create new technology questions. So I'm a director of research with the French CNRS, and uh, we have four European and French projects that are trying to deal in, in this next uh, of technology policy and futures. And I'm also with another hat, I'm heading the European relations for 
the CNRS and the digital area uh, so relations with the uh, European programs for research and innovation. I worked with the um, uh, European Commission for uh, a number of years, first with the future and emerging technologies and then cybersecurity and privacy. Uh, so I was actually at the, um, the beginning of the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting as, a, as an experience. So ju just to say what is this, another acronym from the French, so you know, as you saw before, it's the, uh, uh, the National Center for Scientific Research in France, uh, where you can find 11,000 researchers with um, two, more than 200 labs with industry. So we do all areas of uh, research. So it's interdis multidisciplinary by design. And we happen to be, so we, we were the first beneficiary of the uh, of age 2020, and we are still the first beneficiary of Horizon Europe so far, and we have Nobel Prizes. Uh, many of Nobel Prizes in France uh, come from the CNRS, like last year's Anna Aspect in, uh, in quantum technologies. So what, what is this nexus I'm talking about and what's its impact as we will see in software design? So we, we, we talk about governance. So this is about the systems that are put around something in order to take decisions to have ability. Uh, we talk about policy and mainly public policy in, in this context. So which is uh, aimed at uh, guiding and determining present and future decisions, also guiding, uh, so driving legislation, which are the laws that guide that, that uh, restrain our, our behavior. Uh, and in this nexus, we have technology, which is application of scientific knowledge. And we have to talk about futures, as uh, it was said by many people, I don't know exactly whom, um, because it's um, it's given to, to, to many people. It's, it's difficult to predict things, especially about, especially the future. So it's, the idea is not to predict the future, but for instance, when we're talking technology, we have a, um, a, a trajectory of developing technology and we have a trajectory of developing uh, legislation, but they're completely different in speed and, 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 um, and purpose. So actually, but we will eventually meet in the uh, in future. So we have to take this into account when we're talking about technology that will serve in the future. Because the, the European Union finally recognized the importance of digital and the digital revolution. So since 2016, it started, so actually started with the GDPR a little bit before, but uh, so it has been in overdrive for, uh, for policies to, to to actually to regulate the digital world. And they, they, they had this kind of uh, paper on digital targets for 2030, the Europe's digital decade that uh, David mentioned before. And so you have this on the screen, uh, the, the main thrust for this. And so the first one is putting people in their rights at the center of the digital transformation. This is very important because then you have now it's the technology that has to actually abide to all the fundamental rights that are in the European Union's treaties. So this, this slide here shows just a selected number of laws in the European Union that actually regulate and constrain software, the software industry. So we basically talk about GDPR all the time. So this is about data protection, the personal data protection. But you have a, a, a number of other uh, initiatives that actually regulate the software industry. So I, I, I tried to put into three different families here. So data protection, not only personal, but also, I mean, non-personal. And this relates to the um, areas of data and IoT. You have markets and competition where actually they're trying to regulate tech, but IoT again and the software markets. And you have security, but also, so mainly cyber, but not only. Uh, where you have actually the thin line between national security and European Union security, but also the industry that, that, that goes into protecting uh, systems in, in, in Europe. So GDPR is also uh, high on, on security, but then you have a lot of others. And so one that is being um, discussed now that is the Cyber Resilient Act, 
uh, one that is being agreed uh, two weeks ago, that's the Artificial Intelligence Act. So you have a number, as you see here. So this is just a selection of the laws. So what what, what does this have to be have to be uh, with, with the um, had to do with the uh, with the metaverse? What are the relationships between this and, and the metaverse? Actually, it's because they will, as I said, so constrain what we 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 may do or uh, regarding technologies in the metaverse. So as I said, I'm a researcher. So here, metaverses are not the use of uh, lenses that actually are virtual reality devices so or extended reality. So what we're talking here is it's, it's this conception that is in this slide. So it's, we're talking about something that is massive. So the, meta, the, the metaverse can host a limited number or at least a very high number of concurrent users. They are immersive. Uh, three-dimensional embodied experiences, they're persistent, so never stop a reset. If you leave the metaverse, it will continue its own life. It's open, so if you can have access to the technology, you can go into the metaverse. Perhaps you have to pay a ticket to entry, but it's open. And it's economically developed, so they are already active, so there'll be extensive trade in goods and services. So uh, David showed us a number of of metaverse that already exist, and actually, I saw uh, uh, an article on someone who was actually um, in um, driving a Ferrari in the in the um, physical world with money that he made uh, selling the digital properties in one metaverse. So, and, and this is what, what I also prefer to talk about digital worlds and physical worlds instead of real and virtual because the virtual world is part of our reality today. So, there's, so it's difficult to, to make a difference there. But anyway, so this is the full vision. It's perhaps nothing, it is perhaps not for say two years time or even for 2030, but this is what will happen eventually in my view. So in perhaps, I don't know, 15 years we will start having this. So it will, like in the beginning of the internet, we, we, we went in a trip and then we went in a cyber cafe to consult our mail. So perhaps you go in a trip or even to, to the corner and actually enter uh, a, a, a cyber cafe and then you will have uh, a suit that is plenty of uh, sensors and then we will enter into the suit and then we'll go into a cabin and actually have a metaverse experience. So this will be the beginning and then you go to cinemas or to other places like that and then until the day you have this at home. So what about governance and legislation and what brings this, uh, what are the questions that, it, that they bring into, into technology? So it's a digital world, as I said, and it needs governance inside because it's a world. So we have the governance at the interface. We have some laws that will certainly uh, apply uh, for things that happen in the metaverse, but it's not clear how the, 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 the specific purposes of metaverses will actually uh, be regulated by existing laws. So it's not clear what will be regulated, who will establish and enforce rules, because if we're talking about private worlds, completely different from going outside and to a street where, I mean, you have a public ruling there. And how this will be done in, in in terms of uh, enforcement and governance. One thing is clear is that they will need some kind of uh, order maintenance and then they need governance and they need laws. So one question that it's immediate is if the laws that we have to date, if they are uh, enough for, for private digital worlds. And we have consulting, we've been consulting with two law enforcement agents uh, of some very big um, agencies, and they told us that actually they think that I mean several laws can be can work can be applied to several existing metaverses, but not to all. So actually, we'll need more more uh, more policy legislation. So from the point of, of view of technologies, so a great deal of technology integration research is still required in order to achieve the vision that I showed us, that, that I showed you. Uh, the metaverse that already exists, they, they, are, they, they, they have to become interoperable, they have to be portable, secure, they have to protect data, so they have to comply with laws that exist today. 
and and so a question is how to how do you do that? How do you build metaverses that are compliant? And of course, you have always to to, to keep in mind that metaverse use a lot of energy, so they 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 have a very big impact on climate change probably. So, as we saw, the European Commission is already doing policy and will do legislation in this. So. They have the Horizon Europe program that is doing mainly virtual reality and extended reality, but I would not be surprised if in future, so work programs 25 to 27, they already start calling for some kind of metaverse research. But then you will have to think about protection of avatars, citizens, uh, the, the, the very concept, the very technology that make the metaverse possible, they are antinomic with the personal data protection because actually they need all kinds of bio and neuro metrics in order to make the metaverse. And so how do you protect that from the GDPR point of view? So then you have uh, questions of identity and authentication uh, that we will see uh, a little more in the slides. But one thing that is very interesting is that you have metaverses where you, the, the laws of the physical world don't, don't apply. So you have metaverses where, I don't know, people fly. So, and then how do you regulate this kind of new behaviors that are, will be possible uh, in the metaverses without hindering innovation and creativity? So I will show very quickly uh, an example of technical questions directed by policy. I saw that uh, Roma. Yes, Roman is still in, in the call. So this is something that uh, we did with the uh, Roman board from uh, our lab and other colleagues, and we just presented it uh, at the IEEE, the first actually conference on, 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 on metaverse communications and, uh, in, in Japan. And so you have digital identity, and in a wide sense, this encompasses every attribute of the user, as we'll see. You need data interoperability because these are what is requested by, by, by the laws, actually. Uh, and then we, what we, we will try is to use these cons this, um, constraints that are um, brought by uh, regulation in, in, in find a solution. So we will go into the self-sovereign uh, digital identity authentication. And what leads us actually to think that perhaps what one thing that will be needed is the Schengen of metaverses. So you need the governance that is offline uh, between the metaverses so that if you want to be interoperable, you have to actually pass through these governances. Because imagine that you are in a metaverse from Facebook, for instance. And then you're walking down the street and you see that there's a, a football game between Real Madrid and, and another team at Real Madrid's premises. So you want to go to the stadium. So, but then when you are going to the stadium, actually what you're doing is that you're leaving Facebook's uh, metaverse and you're entering Real Madrid's metaverse. So there's a problem here of transfer of identity. That's a problem, uh, no, not a problem, but a question of uh, how do you travel between metaverses because you will be traveling between different digital worlds. And this is, what, what we, we see here, so you have different uh, metaverses, so they, they were both in uh, David's introduction. They have different technologies and different infrastructures. They have different governances. One is centralized, the other one is more collaborative. But they, if they want to, to operate in Europe, they both have to abide to European laws and regulations and all the all the names that I, I gave you in that slide with all the policies and many more. So, if we concentrate only on the GDPR for the sake of uh, what I'm showing here, so one thing that is, is that is the interoperability, so data portability. So a person ha would have, have the right to actually to transfer from one to the other. So this example that I just gave about going to a football match from one, um, metaverse to the other. So how do you do that? So I have an avatar that is in one world that has its own technologies, infrastructures, its governance that's completely different from the other one. How, how do I go and buy my ticket and enter the new metaverse in order to see the football, the football game? 
So this was the question that was, as I said, derived from the technology advancement, from the regulation uh, status. Uh, so we, we, we chose to look at self-sovereign identities. So imagine that you have this avatar that has plenty of attributes. Uh, so when, when it, it, it tries to enter the Real Madrid stadium, actually probably the only thing that it needs nowadays is name surname and perhaps the age so it perhaps should be uh, a major but it's not even clear so it has to have money it has to have money but certainly the scuba diving certification level is not important for uh for this for this traveling or transfer of um, identity so we used uh the um, the w3c decentralized identifiers in order to implement our protocol that actually allows avatars to travel from uh, metaverses to metaverses, even in the case where you go from a metaverse where you are more or less a human, and you go into another one where you are more or less a fly, so um, which is perfectly feasible. Uh, so it's, it's something that uses the uh, centralized identifiers and you have, uh, so you just you just need to give part of your attributes in order to to be accepted by the verifier that you actually can buy a ticket and go into the uh, the stadium. And this actually comes uh, with a protocol. Uh, so actually, you are in one metaverse, so the metaverse blue, uh, and you want to to travel to the metaverse uh, yellow, yeah. Uh, so what, what you have to do is to publish uh, your distributed uh, identities with public keys and then to the controller and then there's owner and then it's where the governance will enter. So the offline governance, because actually you have to be in a path that is uh, accepted by both metaverses. So you can imagine that like going to, I don't know, North Korea today to be very difficult is more or less. So you need to have um, a, a, an offline path that you can actually be accepted. So all this passport showing, let's say, so the identity wallet, the electronic identity wallet is accepted by, by both uh, metaverses. So I will not get into the details here for the sake of time. But uh, you can see here that actually we have a very detailed protocol. And what I, I want to again to, to bring your attention to is that this protocol that is very detailed and that can be implemented actually was well, was so the need of this protocol was brought up from the fact that we were thinking about how to, to make metaphors interoperable because they are required by law to be interoperable if they want to operate in Europe. So I will uh, finish here. I hope that I didn't uh, spend too much time. Um, so what are the key takeaways I'd like you to, to have is that, uh, so the, the EU policies have a large impact on the software industry. For those who are researchers as I am, uh, it has a huge impact on the research that we do because in the big, so when I started my career as a computer science researcher, I actually, so I was studying books that related to art. So one main book was the art of uh, computer programming. Today is no longer no longer not because we're censored by all these uh, legislations. So we have to really take care of what we are developing because otherwise it has absolutely no use. Uh, so metaverses are coming. That's my my belief, I think they will take longer now that ChatGPT appeared because a lot of funds were diverted into AI, like David mentioned in the beginning. Uh, but they were still, instead of being here in the next 10 years, they'll be here in the next 15, probably. Uh, and then I think that, that the, this interplay between policy and technology is extremely important. So to keep an eye on existing regulations, but I am sure that there'll be the need for new regulations to understand how this this goes forward. And uh, so what we showed here about GDPR and the portability actually requiring new technological solutions. And what we are doing now is that we are, we are programming the proof of concept so that this will actually be tested. 
and perhaps even if we, we can manage to, to have a, a partnership with one of the metaverse or two in order to, to see if this can be really implemented. As I said, we interviewed two law enforcement agents uh, who were actually comforting our positions here, and this work was supported by several projects that I mentioned in the beginning. Thanks for your attention. I hope it was at least a little bit clear. And David, the floor is back to you. If there are questions, I'll be happy to answer. And Roman, as I said, is also in the call. If his mic works, <laughs> perhaps he can also answer. David? OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Afonso. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should move on to, to Shukran's presentation and then take uh, Q&A at the end that covers everything that we've said. So Shukran, do you want to um, show us yeah. what you've got? Yeah, I can uh, share. Thank you, Afonso. In the meantime, do you see my screen? Uh, do you see my screen? Do people yes. see Shukran's screen? Yes. Yes. OK. So starting from where Afonso said, um, um, maybe it takes five or 10 years to see metaverse in, uh, uh, in practice. I think we are already seeing it in practice. For example, speaking from Norway, um, there are several banks that has bought land or space in metaverse, including uh, public bodies. Uh, so for example, the tax authorities here have um, is collaborating with Ernst and Young, uh, and also is the Norwegian Population Registry. They are collaborating with the uh, Ernst and Young uh, to work on uh, how they can benefit from metaverse. Okay, so to start with, um, uh, I will talk about the trustworthiness aspects of uh, metaverse and. Um, I mean, these days, uh, talking about the big actors here uh, from Meta, Microsoft, Apple, uh, NVIDIA, not, not NVIDIA. So they have come up, Google, they have come up with their own uh, headsets uh, with the different tech specifications. But just to get a glance of uh, uh, the basic ones. So here you see HoloLens, which is from Microsoft. Yeah, so it has several sensors uh, from head tracking, uh, eye tracking, uh, depth tracking sensors to cameras to map uh, your face, your eyes, your environment. And uh, if you see, there are five microphones. Um, if, if you think of your smartphone, there was one microphone. If you think of your laptop, uh, which you have worked for many years, it has one or two microphones. But this device that sits on your face, it has five microphones. So definitely it uh, enables all these sensors, uh, advanced sensors, AI, everything. It enables great scenarios. Uh, you know, the learning is impressive. For example, um, autistic children who have difficulty in learning, um, they have shown uh, great results, great impacts, uh, the, the train in terms of you know uh, the learning outcomes the uh, entertainment is so super i mean uh, i myself have seen uh, some movies in metaverse i have practiced skiing in metaverse i have uh, been to antarctica in metaverse it's, it's simply amazing and uh, to perform an experiment we we did some uh, meetings in uh, like teams we have horizon uh, was it horizon horizon meetings in Meta, uh, Meta's metaverse. And to enable such scenarios, as I said, uh, it has advanced sensors which have the capacity uh, to track your facial movements, micro expressions on face, hand movements, head movements, track your eye movements, and you can control objects in metaverse with your gaze. It's very impressive. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, now, before I go into more details on our experiments, let's look at the pre-metaverse world. Let's look at, you know, how we uh, 
interact with the web at the moment uh, through our laptops and through smartphones or IoT devices. And it's not an understatement to say that uh, the advertising industry, the ad tech, um, has funded much of what we enjoy online. So many websites available for free. You can create your own website. For example, I create, uh, I can create a website to teach people how to create metaversal spaces. And I will have an option to you know, dedicate some space for uh, advertisement and I can make, make money from that space. So as a website publisher, I auction a space and the advertiser buys it to reach to potential consumers and billions of such online ads are placed every day on the web pages and applications that we use. And this whole uh, ecosystem is called as uh, real-time bidding, RTB. And it's... Um, It's uh, it's all great things, uh, but there are some uh, issues that we need to take care of. For example, uh, the rules that uh, protect people's personal data must be followed, and which is not the case if we reflect the real world at the moment. Uh, so, for example, in the usual non-metaversal world, uh, the information that is included in a bid request so your user location data, the time zone you are in, the sites you visit, and the way you interact with one second, the way you interact with these uh, websites, the queries you make. It is said it's not that you are searching Google; it's Google searching you also. You know, demographic data and every information that is inferred from that data, and it falls into several sensitive categories, and it could be your mental health, usual health reproductive health, the ethnic group you belong to, substance abuse, politican, political affinities, all that. All could be inferred from uh, such information. And just to indicate some facts, uh, so if you are in US, um, there is a report from ICCL, which is Irish Council for Civil Liberties. And um, they say that if you are in US, your location is exposed 740 time, 747 times a day, which means just, just one data point, that is the location of your data, of your device, is exposed 747 times a day. And if you are in EU, EU you're a little bit lucky that your location is exposed 376 times a day, but still it's a huge number. And just to quote a statement for Germany, so the real-time bidding tracks and broadcast what a person in Germany is doing online roughly once per minute that they are online. And the biggest RTB companies here include Google, Microsoft, uh, and uh, everybody else follows from startups to the big tech. And uh, for example, in Germany, uh, Google broadcasts 21% 20, of the data uh, the RTB request, and Microsoft does it uh, 6% times. And talking about Norway, so 21% RTB broadcast come from Google and 37% come from Microsoft, which I, I never thought is, was possible, but Microsoft, yes, 37%. Now getting back to the metaverse. So here, uh, we did an experiment. Uh, so we used two uh, VR glasses. Uh, so first one was MetaQuest, which has fewer sensors, uh, fewer cap capabilities. Uh, so three sensors, four camera, and it could only do hand tracking. And then an advanced version, which was MetaQuest Pro, which has six sensors, 10 cameras. Uh, so the, the five internal cameras, which are facing uh, your face, it has two cameras, one each for one for each eye uh, to track your eye movements, one for the upper face and two for the lower face on each side of your nose. And then for the external, it had two cameras. One is front facing and two is uh, right facing. And uh, together, including many other sensors, it can track the way you ha your hand moves, uh, your facial expressions to the details 
you know you can frown you you're winking your eyes your cheeks move in certain way it can copy everything in avatar and uh, with these two um, uh, headsets uh, uh, there are two people who are interacting using the, these headsets and we want to interact to uh, to figure out uh, the situation of trustworthiness uh, and uh, in terms of trustworthiness we focused on uh, limited aspects of trustworthiness so for example transparency uh, in terms of what is uh, uh, made uh, you know uh, the as a user of these headset uh, so what users are aware of how the information is processed and uh, any control that user can exert and examining the purpose limitations so and and we also wrote to uh, meta's customer care to meta's engineering team and there we looked at their patents to look at the situation so here we were two people oda and pernille uh who so oda had the older version of the headset and pernille has the newer version of the headset which can do face tracking and eye tracking as well and we wanted to study if uh how does face tracking affect the targeted content and uh, ads so to investigate this um so pernille's task was uh, to show whatever oda would say uh, so pernille will show lack of emotional reactivity will will not maintain eye contact will either look down or away from oda and will not smile or in case she smiles it's very short and in, not so intense smiles and uh, so with this experiment we took screen recordings of facebook feed Uh, before and after for Pernille, and there was only one moment where Oda talks about where Pernille asks about Oda's hair and asks for recommendations on saloons, uh, hair spa or saloons like that, and that was the only time Pernille smiled. And you know what was the Facebook feed? Uh, so after twenty minutes of this experiment, we took Facebook feed. So the first two feeds. the first two uh, post pernille c are motivational posts uh, trying to sell motivational book from amazon and uh, the advertisement uh, it's the groups was uh, braids and hairstyles and uh, to figure out what is said in the privacy policy we look at uh, okay uh, i'll move forward a little bit So we look at the privacy policy. Uh, so here, it says that we process your abstracted facial, abstracted facial expressions data to make your avatar's expression look more natural in VR, and raw image data of your face is stored on your device. That gave me a lot of uh, comfort to know my data is not sent out. and i searched a bit more further what does this raw image data mean or what is abstracted image data so i think 8 or 9 months ago it didn't even say what does raw data image raw image data means but now uh, it added some uh, information that it is the infrared image of your face which is captured from those five internal cameras and then it says that raw image data that is the infrared images of your face is deleted from your headset after the abstracted facial expression data is generated so that kind of give me again confidence you know like oh only they are processing some little data but still nowhere in the policy you will find what is abstracted facial expression and then i look further to find answers uh, so then it says uh, so before this uh, uh, to accept it ask you whether you want to enable facial tracking or no so when i do not enable it's fine but it still copies my expressions because it calibrates my voice and head movement to figure out what i'm trying to say and accordingly makes avatar uh, facial expressions but if i enable the facial expressions then it then it means 
So it says, if you have chosen to share additional data with Meta, we collect additional data about how you use your headset to help Meta personalize your experiences and improve Meta Quest. So whether you accept or not, it is personalizing uh, your uh, Meta experience. By personalizing, it, it doesn't really say what does it mean by personalization, but it, is, it was very evident the kind of ads I see in my metaversal space. And um, okay, now going back to the experiment again. Yeah, so um, another uh, point to note here was that, uh, so the laptop which Pernille was using to check Facebook, it has address of a place which is six hours from Oslo. While uh, the uh, VR headset has the location of Oslo, and if I look at the Facebook uh, uh, targeting, everything is targeted for Oslo, not even once for Trondheim. And it has used, uh, in our judgment until now, it has used our voice and face and eye data, everything for personalization. So wherever your, uh, your gaze is stuck, uh, whatever you say, it kind of uses it to target content to you. Another thing to note, a very impressive uh, feature was that, uh, so Quest 2 did not have any uh, uh, facial tracking, as I said, but it was able to uh, have almost uh, convincing facial expressions. And even if you leave your controllers on your table and you move around your hands, it can copy your hand movements after, I think, 30, 20 seconds. So it's impressive based on just that device sitting on your around your eyes it knows about your hand movements and uh, you can join uh, metaverse using through your avatar or via video and uh, one uh, very uh, crazy thing was that there were no cues when the recording was done for this meeting so generally, uh, on the top right, right eye corner, uh, you would see a red dot. Or ideally, you know, people should see some message or some indication that we are being recorded. So there were no cues. And uh, when I write to Meta uh, and I ask this question, I don't say that I'm a researcher, I'm researching this and that. I just, just was curious. So their response was, before recording the video, the person who is recording should always ask if the other participants agree to being recorded. And um, other than that, uh, you can share your screens in, uh, in these workrooms. And uh, one strange thing was I was sharing my screen. And now just imagine if I leave this Teams meeting and it still says I'm trying to connect and my screen is still shared. How would, how should I feel? So this was a bit crazy to note that uh, my screen was still there for participants to see. And um, yeah, so just to reiterate, um, we noticed some gaps in the privacy policy. So nothing is clearly said about what is exactly abstracted facial expressions or what is abstracted, abstracted gaze data. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, even on abstracted uh, information, they were precisely were able to target the content and the ads, which was surprising and scary because it should not come at the cost of privacy, but it did. And the kind of data it collects, um, you know, extremely personal and sensitive inferences can be made. It's really hard to hide your emotions or expressions uh, when, when five cameras are very advanced ones are watching your micro expressions. Yeah, uh, so in short, uh, um, there are, you know, uh, there is a creation and sharing of personal data profiles about people. And if you look back to the RTB, uh, 
So David mentioned that uh, by in two two and a half years from now, it will be a trillion dollar uh, uh, business, and uh, I'm sure it's not coming for free. Uh, the RTB is involved there. The ad tech is involved there, and it feels so. This whole uh, situation at the moment is the data sharing, the data uh, collection, the data processing is disproportionate. It's uh, intrusive. It's uh, unfair. And if I have to give only one reason for that, for this assessment, is that uh, people are not aware of what is happening. And um, yeah, so we, at the end, um, we need to examine uh, these virtual and augmented worlds. We also know them by extended reality, the metaverse, the mixed reality. We need to maneuver them thoughtfully and evaluating not just their benefits, but also their potential impact on us as individuals and us as a society. Because if not taken care of, it can aggravate the existing problems of uh, polarity, extremism, manipulation, and all those things that follows. And um, in our roles as uh, scientists, designers, policy makers, technologists, computer scientists, um, we need to take actions to, to influence uh, how these technologies can, um, can impact our lives positively, uh, in particular by respecting privacy, autonomy, and uh, the basic human values. And uh, just very quickly, uh, so there is a report from Financial Times where uh, they assessed several of Meta's patents, to which maybe you and I may not have access. Maybe FT had some special privileges. And um, they presented some of the uh, uh, really amazing uh, scientific innovations. Um, so, and this is one. Um, from avatar fidelity and personalization. So using just one or two or three pictures of yours, an avatar can be created in real time. So this is just to describe uh, one of the pattern, but there are many that talks about uh, how uh, Meta is going to tap into the uh, economic aspects of Metaverse. And these are some of the references that uh, we can look into afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shukun. Um, and we'll be making the uh, the slides available from these presentations after this event in the next couple of days. And as you will see, we uh, this was also recorded, so hopefully. Um, you can catch up with anything that you missed um, when we make this available. So um, again, apologies for the uh, the troubles at the beginning. I have no idea what that was about, but uh, if anybody has got any questions that you'd like to put to any of the speakers, um, please raise your hand and um, let us know what you wish to uh, to ask. Tiberius, good to see you. Good to hear from you. Hello, good to see you. Sorry, I'm I'm in the city now, so I'll put my camera off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th thanks, thanks for all the presentations and the insights. Uh, two weeks ago, I've been to in London to something the, uh, the economists organized, and it's called Metaverse Enterprise Summit. And it is new to me. I am more in, in research in scholarly communication and the influence of trackers and persuasive technologies in research. So I wanted to, to learn more about this world. It, 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 it was new, completely new to me. So one thing that I've learned, and this is also a question for the speakers, is that while uh, hardware and software in metaverse uh, extended realities, immersive technologies, 
new world, new digital world, whatever. While this is for the future, an important infrastructure which is not seen is at the present and also at the past. So there were people there discussing about uh, how they use metaverse for their drills in the ocean, Shell and others. There were people explaining how they use metaverse for several years in remote engineers, like uh, water management companies with their uh, swing pipes, uh, having uh, 150 and more headsets per unit with uh, engineers working with them daily, and also training companies or training services at uh, big pharma companies, Pfizer and others, where they deliver for some years now in Metaverse, their training programs. So one thing in that infrastructure, which was common to everyone, was what they called digital twins. So while Metaverse is not so much visible in applications at this moment, it happens in different organizations without making big noise. But what is very important for them is to build the digital twins in which we will immerse with whatever hardware and software. So the ocean in which we need to immerse is made of digital twins and companies are busy, uh, organizations, not only companies are busy to build these digital twins at this moment. Maybe this is something, I, I don't want to make an extensive comment, but this is something maybe the speakers would, would like to engage with. The underlying infrastructure for metaverse stays in creating today, not tomorrow, digital twins. With all the benefits, questions, problem, ethical aspects, of course, uh, these digital twins are collecting data. You need to input data. Uh, there is a lot a lack of uh, frame, uh, legal framework and so on. So maybe without making a question mark, the, the, my question is how would you comment on the creation of this silent infrastructure, mainly digital twins? Thank you. Thank you, Tiberius. Um, Shukun um, or Alfonso, do you want to respond to um, Tiberius's question about digital twins? Uh, not me, <laughs> but I'm aware that uh, uh, even in our company for fire drills, uh, Metaverse is used. Microsoft HoloLens are used for training in, uh, in in situations of fire. And it's used for military training. Uh, the US Marines are using Microsoft HoloLens to train for combat. Um, and it's used in hospitals to, for example, in COVID times, um, uh, a doctor with just one doctor would walk around in a ward and come back with all the um, uh, updates, uh, and then that way that way they would save lot many PPEs every single day, 60% PPE in a day. So it has applications and it has been silently used without much noise. Thank you, Shokun. Afonso, did you want to add anything? Yes. Uh, so just to compliment. So first, thanks, Shokun, for for your nice presentation on on, on this um, all these new world that of of uh, surveillance that is emerging. So coming back to Tiberius' uh, comments, I think that they are spot on. Um, so for instance, the European Commission has been uh, funding research in digital twins for a number of years now. And and they are extremely important. So I'd like I'd like just to to re, um, re no, not refocus but uh, to, to to put it back on on perspective. So when I describe the vision of metaverses, so metaverses are not these things that you use a glass only to actually to have a training, for instance. So as I said, so it's massive, immersive, persistent, which is very important, open, and economically developed. So this is actually so that the full vision many years down the road. What you were mentioning about all these uh, applications. Uh, so I have also actually um, already experienced them. Is that what you do is, for instance, you want to train a new person into some kind of specific machinery, uh, which is kind of difficult to use. 
So what you do is that you do a digital twin of a specific machinery, and then you transfer, so digital, so it's, uh, it's, in, it's in software, and you put, for instance, a, a virtual or extended reality uh, glasses on, and you interact with that digital twin of the specific machinery, and you get trained on that digital 3D environment where actually you can touch as well, so you can do many things. So one of the experiences I had was that, so the specific machine was there and actually I could touch the machine, but actually without touching it, just touching its digital. So these are different things, but they, they will converge eventually on metaverses. So you can have digital twins that are used without the metaverses. They are used for training, uh, for instance. And this is, as you were completely right, so this is the silent infrastructure that you, will, that you have there. And that is, uh, you need it. So, which actually brings new problems, new questions to the table, because digital twins, for instance, can be used in order to, uh, to, to tackle security flaws, for instance. But once actually you have this, the digital twin, actually you can play with the digital twin in order actually to, 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 to get access to the, to, to the uh, physical uh, machine or, or environment. So digital twins are, are in itself, in themselves, an area of research and development and is extremely rich, I'm sure. I just want to add uh, one very quick thing. I have uh, been with the polar bear <laughs> in Metaverse and have looked around, you know, 360 degrees <laughs> up and down. So it's really impressive from, uh, 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 what do you say, a flower pot to a polar bear to uh, South Pole, it was all possible. And to also the International Space Station, very impressive. And all thanks to Digital Twins. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Um, any more questions before we, before we wrap up? Ronnie? Uh, yes, um, uh, Shukun, you, you talked about uh, real-time bidding and the uh, privacy implications of of, um, of of those practices. And uh, I agree with you; they they're awful. Uh, a lot to do with uh, these third-party cookies and so on. And but most browser vendors are now kind of uh, fading out the third-party cookies. And then the good thing is from my perspective, uh, uh, is that uh, they are replaced by way more privacy friendly techniques, such as the uh, uh, the privacy sandbox uh, is one famous uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. Have you have you have you looked into these kind yeah, of yeah. things How they will impact the metaverse? Uh, I, I still have to study, but I'm aware Google has launched their privacy sandbox an year ago, I think. I did not know about it and uh, they are getting rid of third party cookies. Yes. And it's going to have some positive impact, but what really bothers me now is uh, uh, that the RTB will be fed um, a lot more sensitive information, even if it's first part going only via first party cookie consent, so to say. So uh, the yeah, issue... I'd like to add to the question. So, uh, so. What you showed us actually seems that for for me that they're in complete breach of GDPR. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. But also like they kind of play around. <laughs> in my opinion, I think they are circumventing because um, it's not uh, not not exactly the sensitive data. You know, they make sense. They infer something from sensitive data, and that is what they share. Because so many places they say. Uh, the raw data is not shared. The raw data doesn't leave your device. But at the end, what they share, they are still able to perform those targetings that um, they used to do. So in my opinion, it's um, uh, the computation models have changed a bit. <laughs> so it's more edge-based uh, solutions now, processing now. The data still stays on your device, and uh, the, the whole ad tech still operates in pretty much the same way. But I agree, Ronnie. Um, there, there are some positive uh, things happening in that field also. 
Yeah. But By the way, consent... you don't have to you don't have to leak the raw data. The relationships between all this data is is sufficient to uh, to get a lot of tracking actually. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tiberius, have you got your hand up again or did you just not put it down? Maybe I, you left I think it. I, didn't put, I, did, I didn't put it back, so I, I sorry. Don't worry, don't worry. I'll put it back, thank you. Uh, don't worry. Um, any, any other questions for uh, the speakers? Uh, so one question for Shukun, what, what are you going to be looking at next? Yeah, <laughs> I have so, so many things to do. So one thing is um, trans, the lack of transparency and uh, to push um, the industry to provide more information. But then the problem, the, the whole responsabilization of <laughs> accepting the risks falls on consumers. So consumers need to understand what they are consenting to. So my idea is to work on um, some solutions to rethink consent, uh, especially for metaverse, because uh, of the sensitivity of information that is captured uh, there to lower the risks uh, based on consent. Because out of those six legal processing grounds, consent is the most exploited, you know, even if Facebook will say very clearly what they are going to use their data for. But we got into this habit of accepting the consent and and also to note that, uh, for example, uh, Apple's uh, Vision Pro, it cost $3,500. Uh, and MetaQuest Pro uh, in Norway, it costed me around two, uh, uh, around three, $300. But now they are selling it for much cheaper, especially the Meta. So they are going to make money by selling data because mm. they cannot cover the costs. <laughs> Uh, of these advanced sensors and uh, yeah, so yeah, we we are going to see some disruptions in the data ecosystem, not so positive ones. Understood. Well, we look forward to seeing the results of your uh, next set of results and research. Um, and it leaves it for me to say that uh, thank you to both to Afonso and to Shukun and to um, our participants for sticking with us despite the initial uh, difficulties. Um, we started off, well, I started off by saying it was difficult to separate hype from reality. So I'd like to think that we have edged a bit more closer to getting our own personal answers to that uh, conundrum. Um, the answer, I think, inevitably lies somewhere between the two. Um, but I think we've seen enough and heard enough to indicate that there is something very real going on. How it turns out is going to be fascinating for all of us. So with that, thank you very much and um, have a great afternoon. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you, thank you, David. Thank you thank everyone you. for Bye. joining. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.